In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. If coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous, as sentiment often attributed to Albert Einstein, if that is the case, it would seem that God is at work today. When we were scheduling for this weekend's Rite 13 events, we didn't review the lectionary in advance. But even so, in today's readings, we find not one, but two call narratives. Isaiah is called to help the nation of Israel lament and make sense of the devastation of Assyrian and later Babylonian occupation and exile. In the selection immediately following what we read here today, Isaiah hears that Israel's desolation will continue until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is utterly desolate. But Isaiah also hears that like an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled, the seeds of the future remain in that stump. In the end, God promises to deliver God's people, and Isaiah is his messenger. In the Gospel of Luke today, Peter and then James and John are called to share in Jesus' news of God's salvation, to follow Jesus in discipleship, so that they can continue to spread the word of God when Jesus is no longer able to do so himself. And in a way, over this weekend, this group of 15 All Saints young people, we could say that they came together to consider their calling. Over the years, the wisdom that has emerged from this community has found that it is important at this point in the life of a young person and their family to recognize the changes they are going through, to name the happy reality that these young people are moving from childhood toward adulthood, to recognize with their parents how parental roles will adapt, and for all of us in community to come together to ask for God's blessing for them and to bless each other as we move into this new time. So yesterday, these young people spent the afternoon here together. Their day was organized around three questions. Who am I? Who is God to me? And who are we together? Let me tell you, it was a privilege to be part, excuse me, to be part of those conversations with them. Our young people are remarkable. They are artists and performers. They're athletes and dancers. They're budding theologians and comedians, lots of comedians. Almost every one of them agreed that yes, they could in fact survive two whole days without their cell phones. And almost everyone disagreed with the suggestion that the New York Yankees are the best baseball team in America. These young people are remarkable, and though we might often think of them as the future, they're also a critical part of the church today. They bring life and freshness and challenging thought. Their reflections will send me back to my books Who made up the word God anyway, one asked. As often as not, they use they pronouns to express the divine, which actually makes a lot of sense. On the one hand, they say it is too hard to come up with words that describe God. It's very wise. Our words can never capture God's essence. And yet when facing a wall full of images, that was put up to prompt a question, a response to this question, who is God? Their words flowed. God is in all of these images, one said. While another responds, I wouldn't use any of these images to describe God. I would have a big blank white wall that just said G-O-D. 
D in large letters. When says God isn't a being like we think of that word, God is too big for our thoughts. God is nothing we can understand. And then from another teen, I can feel God. God is life. This is important work, important reflection. Unlike Isaiah, who was called by God in a moment and cleansed with a coal touched to his mouth, or Peter, who in a moment of recognition fell down at Jesus' knees. They started working with these questions long ago, our young people, and they didn't finish finding their answers yesterday. This is a lifelong journey, but this weekend, we pause to honor them and to bless that journey. As we've been preparing for yesterday and today, thinking about the young people and their parents, I've had a melody ringing in my head all week, and fortunately it is one that I like. It's an a cappella rendition of Khalil Gibran's poem on children. Some of you may be familiar with that. Your children are not your children, he says. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but they are not from you. And though they are with you, they belong not to you. You can give them your love, but not your thoughts. They have their own thoughts. You can house their bodies, but not their souls. For their souls dwell in a place of tomorrow, which you can't visit, not even in your dreams. You can strive to be like them, but you cannot make them just like you. Today we come together to honor who they are, who they are growing into. They are not ours, but they are ours to bless. Several weeks back during Advent, Michael, our seminarian, led a class with some of the middle school students on Mary's visitation to Elizabeth and Mary's response to Elizabeth's welcome of her, a response that has come down through the ages to us known as the Magnificat. And these teens talked about what they noticed in the text. They noticed many things, but one of the things that seems very strange to them, something that didn't fit with their understanding of expected human behavior or with how a narrative would typically develop. Isn't it strange, they said, that when Mary hears Elizabeth's greeting, she just breaks out in song. She just starts singing. And she goes on for quite some time. Isn't that weird? But as you look at this exchange, Something interesting is going on. Mary is young, probably not much older than some of you. She's not yet married, and she faces, at the very least, being an outcast, and at worst, maybe great danger because of her pregnancy. Elizabeth may have been the first person Mary shared her news with. She could have responded in any number of ways. She could have shamed Mary. She could have shunned her. She could have been fearful on her behalf. Instead, Elizabeth recognized the hand of God at work, and in the words of one author, her heart opened wide to her cousin, completely empty of judgment. How unexpected is that? Elizabeth is confronted by her teenage niece, unmarried and pregnant, 2,000 years ago in the Palestinian countryside, and her reaction is to bless Mary. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And in response to the gift of blessing, as the middle school students noted, Mary broke out in song. With Elizabeth's affirmation, Mary found her voice, expressing the words of the tradition she carried within herself and taking it to very new places. So following Elizabeth and her blessing of Mary today, we will bless these young people and their parents. 
In the words of the poet John O'Donohue, our blessing will draw a circle of light around them to protect, heal, and strengthen. May our blessing in some mysterious way that happens in the body of Christ help them to find their voice, help them to lead all of us to that place of tomorrow that we can't even imagine, except perhaps through them. Amen.